Good evening. It's been two days since Americans woke up to news of the deadliest mass shooting on U.S. soil. Amid policy debates over homeland security, the political world has been transfixed by how the two presumptive pre presidential nominees are responding to this moment of national crisis. We'll talk about what the candidates and party leaders have been saying in just a moment. But first, here's what the voters think, or at least a window into that. We have a new national Bloomberg politics poll hot off the presses. It shows Hillary Clinton leading Donald Trump by double digits in a head-to-head -head general election matchup, 49% to 37%. This poll was conducted from Friday to Monday, so the shooting in Orlando occurred while it was in the field, making it the first major telephone survey conducted since the attack. Yesterday, we added a few questions related to that tragedy, including one that asked likely voters which presidential candidate they think would be better as commander-in-chief at handling an event similar to the one in Orlando. 45 percent said Trump and 41 percent said Hillary Clinton. 15 percent said they weren't sure. Mark, we will have more from this poll, and we'll talk with our pollster, Ann Selzer, later in the program. But just from the little bit we've discussed so far, what do you think and what do you find most striking about these numbers? Well, the survey shows what a lot of Democrats and Republicans have been saying, saying privately, which is in the run-up to Orlando, based on the events of the last 10 days or so, and in, and in the wake of Orlando, Hillary Clinton is, uh, is showing herself at her best, and Donald Trump is struggling with all but his core supporters. Clinton at 49, Sanders and uh, Trump at 37. I won't say that's her ceiling in his floor, and Republicans uh, certainly hope that that's not the case, but that is, a, that is a, uh, a spread that's about as wide as you can imagine in a polarized world with her edging towards 50 percent. And our poll is going to confirm what a lot of private data has said and what a lot of Republicans are afraid of, which is that Trump may now be pretty far behind in this race as a snapshot of where we are right now. Right. And let's and let's just be clear. You know, I, I described the timing of this, but this essentially this poll takes into full account uh, Donald Trump's problems, the problems he made for himself by making those racist comments about Judge Curiel um, and, and getting way, uh, day after day of negative news <clears throat> coverage for doing so, criticism from the left, the right, the center from all over the place. It does also include just this one night of polling uh, since Orlando. Um, so that's the, the time frame here. What what it doesn't include. Hey John, it also. Yeah, yeah. It also, include, it also includes, of course, the coming together of the Democratic Party with President Obama coming uh, yes. in behind Hillary Clinton, along with Joe Biden, the First yes. Lady, and Elizabeth Warren. And yes. so while Trump has been struggling in the media, uh, Clinton has had a story uh, working towards unity. Right. That's true. Uh, and and, and it, it, I would actually uh, even add further to that. The one thing it doesn't include is it doesn't include the full unity of the Democratic Party yet, because as we'll talk about later on the show, Bernie Sanders not yet endorsed Hillary Clinton. And so there's still some part of the Democratic Party that's not on board the Clinton bandwagon. So she probably still could benefit or will benefit in terms of her polling strength when that eventuality occurs. We're not sure when it will occur, but it probably will. And when it does, she's going to get some more good news and more uh, more of a lift in the polling. So uh, I agree with you 100 percent. You know, the horse race is, is ugly. I, I would say, though, that it is, is, is striking, um, although it's within the margin of error, it's striking in terms of our, our post Orlando questions uh, that more uh, more voters say that they think Donald Trump would be a good commander in chief in a situation such as this. Trump still has a few percentage point leads, again, with, within the margin of error, but he's he leads her on that. He also leads her in the attributes uh, that she, he's better, he, that voters see him as better at handling terrorism in general. So uh, that's also consistent with some things we have seen in past polling, but it's uh, worth noting here. Yep. All right, since the shooting over the weekend, Donald Trump has been talking and tweeting quite a bit. One thing he's been stressing is the fact that President Obama and Hillary Clinton are, he says, wrong for not using the words, quote, radical Islamic terrorism to describe the motives and basis of these kinds of attacks. Yesterday, during part of his national security speech, Trump said he suspected that Clinton might give in and start using the phrase. But at a campaign event in Pittsburgh today, Clinton showed no signs that she's going to back down on that. I have clearly said that we faced terrorist enemies who use a perverted version of Islam to justify slaughtering innocent people. We have to stop them, and we will. So if Donald suggests I won't call this threat what it is, he hasn't been listening. But I will not demonize and declare war on an entire religion. Trump's words will be, in fact, they already are, 
a recruiting tool for ISIS to help them increase its ranks of people willing to do what we saw in Orlando. He's turning Americans against Americans, which is exactly what ISIS wants. Leaders who've actually fought terrorists know this. He says he knows more about ISIS than the generals do. <laughs> it's almost hard to even think of what to say about that claim. <laughs> he said, I'll abolish the Second Amendment. Well, that's wrong. He said, I'll let a flood of refugees into our country without any screening. That's also wrong. These are demonstrably lies. But he feels compelled to tell them because he has to distract us from the fact he has nothing substantive to say for himself. Right around the time Clinton was speaking in Pittsburgh, President Obama was at the White House meeting with his national security team, and then the president defended his own word choices with some pretty fiery remarks to reporters in the cash room at the Treasury Department. There's not been a moment in my seven and a half years as president where we have not been able to pursue a strategy because we didn't use the label radical Islam. Not once has an advisor of mine said, man, if we really use that phrase, we're going to turn this whole thing around. Not once. So if someone seriously th thinks that we don't know who we're fighting, they know full well who the enemy is. So do the intelligence and law enforcement officers who spend countless hours disrupting plots and protecting all Americans, including politicians who tweet and appear on cable news shows. They know who the nature of the enemy is. So there's no magic to the phrase radical Islam. It's a political talking point. It's not a strategy. And the reason I am careful about how I describe this threat has nothing to do with political correctness and everything to do with actually defeating extremism. Groups like ISIL and Al-Qaeda want to make this war a war between Islam and America. That was intense, President Obama at the White House. Our new Bloomberg Politics National Poll, we asked likely voters if avoiding the term radical, radical Islam makes the U.S. look weak in the fight against terrorism. 47% said they agreed with that statement. 44 said they disagreed, so pretty split on, within the margin of error. So, John got President Obama and Hillary Clinton on one side, Donald Trump on the other. Who is getting the better of this argument? Well, um, first, let's just say that this is a, this, this, this picture that we've seen right here today, two on one, uh, two political heavyweights, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, both taking on Trump, uh, is a striking thing to watch, and it's something we're going to see a lot over the course of the general election. You know, that, that poll number that we cited right there is, is, is interesting, um, uh, the fact that, 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 there is, that there is some uh, sense that, that Trump is on to something, at least in a narrow way, that the public is sort of as on his side, that they to believe that, uh, that the administration does not liking to use, Democrats not liking to use the phrase radical Islam, um, is a, a weak point. Uh, but it's also the case that on a lot of other matters that Trump has put forward on our poll, uh, suggests that uh, the Democrats, that, that he's really in the wrong place. His suggestion yesterday that maybe President Obama was weak on, on Islamic terror because he's on the side of Muslims, a wide, wide majority of people disagree with that. Um, and uh, they also uh, are very strongly against the notion of increasing surveillance on domestic, about Muslims living in America. So Trump, that one, I can see why he's focused here on the, the, on the language issue, because it's one of the few areas substantively where he seems to have a really strong, or has to have a bit of a strong hand. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly a point of view there, probably, uh, I would I'm definitely breaking down along partisan lines, uh, but it is testament to the confidence that Hillary Clinton and the president have, that Hillary Clinton has the upper hand overall on foreign policy in their view, that they both are going after him in a very, in a, and they're not hiding from it. This is an issue Trump has talked about for months, 
They've not engaged him on it in this, this as direct a way, and it shows you that they believe they're at a moment in time when confronting Trump, even where Trump thinks he's on offense and where he may well be on offense, at least to some extent, is what they think is the right thing to do, and they're feeling confident enough to do it. Right. Well, and they also think, and they also think, I think that this is a, they're translating this into not just a policy uh, discussion, but a character discussion and trying to make it clear that their argument is that Trump, the way he talks, makes him unfit to be president of the United States, and that's going to be a key part of Hillary Clinton's argument going forward. All right. So, uh, Democrats are not the only ones who have a problem with Donald Trump's reaction to the Orlando shooting. Since Trump's speech about the war on terror yesterday, Republican leaders seem to be distancing, distancing themselves on both policy and political grounds from their party's presumptive nominee. Senator Bob Corker, the Republican chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, who praised Trump's last major foreign policy address and has been talked about as a potential running mate for Trump, told reporters today that his remarks, Trump's remarks, that is, were not what Corker expected and that Corker was, quote, discouraged by the campaign that Trump is running. And here's what House Speaker Paul Ryan said when asked during a Capitol Hill press conference about Trump's proposed temporary ban on Muslims entering the United States. I do not think a Muslim ban is in our country's interest. I do not think it is reflective of our principles, not just as a party, but as a country. And I think the smarter way to go in all respects is to have a security test and not a religious test. Mark, uh, in the past, uh, Trump has clearly benefited politically by projecting strength in moments of national crisis, especially in the context of the Republican nomination fight. But this time, we're seeing many of his party's leaders either staying silent or rejecting Trump's positions out of hand. And concerns are growing, I know you're hearing it, among Republicans that Trump might be losing not just news cycles, but the entire general election before it really even begins. So uh, what do you think are the sources of that more pervasive sense of concern among Republicans about Trump's standing with the electorate? Well, it runs across the board. They don't see a turnaround in Trump's uh, level of discipline. They don't see an organization being built. They're worried that the convention uh, planning is going too slow for some of them. They see private data that suggests that Trump's performance and Hillary Clinton's performance in the last 10 days have hurt him. And, of course, he continues to create controversy and not talk about issues like the economy and changing Washington, as he did uh, last Tuesday in a way that, that was making them feel better about the campaign. It can change around, turn around again. But right now, the biggest thing going on in this presidential race is a lot of the media and a lot of Republicans, mostly ones who don't want Trump to win, but including some who do, think that this thing is being cooked right now in a way that will be difficult for Trump to recover from. All right, you and I talked to a lot of smart strategists who've done a lot of presidential campaigns over the years, and we've talked about it on this show, the notion that presidential campaigns are won or lost not in the fall, but in the spring and early summer. Um, Trump's uh, comments about Judge Curiel, we've talked about them a lot. A lot of people have talked about them. They couldn't have, not only were they, were they bad for Trump, but they couldn't have come at a worse time for Trump. And then to see the reaction of Republican leaders to Trump's speech yesterday, his tweets on Sunday, uh, his attack on President Obama on the morning shows yesterday, all of it has created this sense of, you know, he, this is a moment that normally Trump has benefited from. They're looking at this and people are running and turning tail. And I, I feel like they wouldn't be running, turning tail and running from maybe quite the, same, the way they are if they didn't sense that this might be a sinking ship for all the reasons that you just described. Yeah, they find it difficult to uh, accept the fact that Trump's going to stop making unforced errors. So right. the question is, John, can Trump turn this around in the short term? And if so, how does he do it? Well, um, I, I am increasingly of the view that a guy who is Donald Trump, a guy who is 69 years old, um, has been the character that he's been for as long as he's been, and who's had so many positive reinforcements for the behavior uh, that he's exhibited, both as a businessman and as a candidate <clears throat> in the Republican nomination fight, is just unlikely to change. And that people who in the Republican Party are praying for him suddenly to become more presidential, to pivot, they're just, they're, they're barking up the wrong tree or they're whistling in the graveyard or whatever cliche you want to use. I don't know. I could imagine a million things that Donald Trump could do to turn this around. My question is just whether he has it in them or he has anything like the inclination to do those things. And so far, there's no evidence that he does. I don't know that this would be enough, but he needs to pick a really successful running mate that someone perceived as ready to be president from day one and broadens his brand a little bit. He needs a great convention and he needs a great first debate. All those things are within his grasp, but boy, he better, he better be planning those things now because if he's going to approach them in the same ad hoc way he approaches most everything else, I don't think he's going to pull off that important trifecta. Yeah, I mean, all of those things, obviously, given the nature of his candidacy, will be more, even more important than usual. But the question is whether, even if he does those things you just suggested, whether it may be too late if he does enough damage to himself over the next month or so, in addition to what he's already done.
All right, um, up next, the great and powerful pollster, Ann Selzer, shows us what she's, what, what's behind the curtain of her and our latest Bloomberg Politics National Poll. We'll be right back with those numbers after these words from our sponsors. back. We're joined now by the woman behind our brand new Bloomberg Politics National Survey. Our very beloved pollster Ann Selzer comes to us from just outside of Des Moines, Iowa. Ann, thanks for coming back on. Always great to be here. I want to talk first about Hillary Clinton. Obviously, as we said in the first block, she's got a 12-point lead in the national horse race poll amongst likely voters. Let's talk about the groups that are powering that big lead. And this is the first time, Mark, that we have measured a third-party candidate uh, in the race. So she does well with the traditional groups you would expect her to do well with. Her numbers just aren't quite as high as if you're trying to compare back to 2012. And a lot of people are playing that game of how is she doing with this particular group and is she going to be able to hit the number. So the groups she does well with are the groups you would expect, the non-white groups, the non-married group, and the non-male group, that is, women. She's doing very well with those groups right there, as you would expect. She's also winning a majority of the under 35 age group, and I think that's going to really be the bright spot for her in this poll. And it's because uh, the Bernie Sanders people now are coming on board with Hillary Clinton. Uh, she gets 55 percent of people who say they supported Bernie Sanders in the nominating contest. Now, that's 55 percent. She's still losing a total of 40 percent, 40 points, to Donald Trump and to Gary Johnson. So that's something to take a look at there. So, Ann, let's look at the other side of the, of the aisle, look at Donald Trump. Um, what, what's the, in terms of his support, he's obviously pretty far behind Hillary Clinton in the horse race now, but who's, who's with him and who's against him? That's right. Well, his, his support, if you look at the, the groups that are the most likely to support him, are the mirror image of the Clinton group. So he does well with whites. He does especially well with white men. Um, he does well with married men. Uh, he does well with men, <laughs> yeah, but, and whites, anyway, that you take a look at it. I think the additional thing that he has going for him are evangelicals. That's the one area where he, he, it's, in fact, his strongest support. Fifty-four percent of evangelicals say they, are pref they prefer Trump over of Hillary Clinton or Gary Johnson. As Donald Trump would say, the evangelicals love him. Um, they do. What, is, what, are the, what does the poll say about their respective weaknesses right now, Trump and Clinton? 
Yeah, one of the things that we wanted to check in with is things that have been going on, things that have been talked about, things that they've been charging each other with. You know, how bothered are voters with with what is being said about the candidates? Um, for Hillary Clinton, the thing that bothers people the most about her is the Wall Street speeches. I mean, that's the reason that you heard Bernie Sanders beat up on her. Um, it's the reason that Trump is likely to beat up on her. It's the thing that bothers the most. 50 percent saying they're bothered a lot uh, by that kind of talk. By comparison, for Trump, you know, you talked earlier about his comments to the Mexican judge and his comments, which I think 55 percent said that bothered him a lot, bothered them a lot. And you talked about the Muslim ban, I think 51 percent roughly in that area said that bothered them a lot. 60 percent are bothered by the way he talks about women. So when we say he's losing with women and women are a majority of the electorate and he's losing by a lot, um, the, his, the, the language part of this, the semantics part of this um, is part of what's driving people to say, look, I'm, I, that, that doesn't sound presidential, that doesn't sound like a candidate I want to support. So, Ann, we got a few questions. We got, we, we got a bunch of questions in uh, about Orlando in the wake of Orlando last night in the poll, so a smaller sample than the rest of the poll, but we did ask some very specific things. One of them was on an assault weapons uh, ban, uh, obviously a big part of the political discourse now because Hillary Clinton's really pushing it. It's re, re, uh, kicked that, that back into the debate. What did, what did we learn in the poll about how people feel about that proposal? Well, the American public is divided on that issue. It is just about half and half saying that they agree that there should be a ban on assault weapons to, for sale to civilians, and about half say they disagree with that. That's one of those kind of issues that there's a cleavage in the American electorate about what to do about that kind of thing. Okay, and um, thank you very much. Uh, for joining us. We appreciate it. We're going to talk more about the poll later in the program. When we come back, we check in on the Democratic Unity Project right after this. to your initiative, Clinton Global Initiative, if your wife is president? We'll think very clearly about it and we'll, and we'll do the right thing. There'll clearly be some changes in what the Clinton Foundation does and how we do it, and we'll just have to cross that bridge when we come to it. 
That was former President Bill Clinton talking to Bloomberg Television's David Weston at the Clinton Global Initiative Conference today in Atlanta. Clinton spoke as voters in Washington, D.C. finally get their chance to cast ballots in the last nomination context, contest of 2016. Now, over here, we are more focused on what happens after the polls close in the nation's capital when Bernie Sanders is expected to meet with Hillary Clinton to discuss the future of his campaign. According to news reports, Sanders huddled with close advisors over the weekend up in Vermont as he mulled his next move. Today, during a press availability in Washington, D.C., Sanders uh, did not offer his endorsement of Hillary Clinton and said that the Democratic Party leadership needs to change. While Sanders is still talking about the possibility of keeping his campaign alive until the convention next month, he's been shedding staff and stopped being critical of Clinton in public appearances. So, Mark, my question for you on the basis of all of that, where does the prospect of Democratic unity stand? I think the CW is he's going to get out like a quote-unquote normal candidate. I think he will be on a trajectory to stop uh, hitting Secretary Clinton, but I think he wants to go into, into Philadelphia with guns somewhat blazing, tr still trying to change the Democratic Party. So I think he'll be out of the race effectively, but wait till Philadelphia and see what kind of frame of mind he's in about trying to make changes that will require continuing to press on the roll call for as many votes as possible. Right, I think it matters a lot what happens between him and Hillary Clinton in this meeting tonight and, and what's going on behind the scenes between their campaigns. It's clear that there are two possible places where Sanders can push for change. One is on the platform and the other is on the process of nominating a president. And it's obvious from the things he said in his press conference today and other things he's been saying privately for some weeks, much more focused on the latter, on trying to do open primary, same-day registration uh, going forward. And I think that it's likely Hillary Clinton's going to be fine with giving those things to him, which Put, will put things on track uh, towards a more unified convention rather than a less unified convention if she were going to be resistant on that front. Yeah, you know, you're, you're seeing so much attention on unity and the symbolism we're seeing, even though they had to cancel their event this week because of Orlando, of uh, President Obama, as you said earlier, double teaming uh, 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 Donald Trump. It doesn't mean Bernie Sanders is irrelevant, but nope. they're capturing a lot of the energy of the party right now without his being on board, and that reduces right. his leverage. Yep. All right. When we come back, we'll talk to the Libertarian nominee for vice president, what he has to say about his hopes for the general election and about everything that's been going on in the news the last 48 hours right after this. Joining us now is the only 2016 candidate so far, 
campaigning to become the vice president of the United States. It's the former governor of Massachusetts, Bill Weld, who's running on the Libertarian Party ticket with former New Mexico Governor Gary Johnson. Governor, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, we have a fair amount of time to spend with you today. Um, we're going to spend a little bit in this little segment of the show talking about what's been going on. Um, we've heard from Hillary Clinton. We've heard from Donald Trump. We've heard from uh, Barack Obama about the re what, what should be done about to prevent more incidents like what happened in Orlando. What say you? Well, I mean, it's sickening, of course, but I do think there are things that can be done. Uh, these lone wolves, you know, acting by inspiration from ISIS way over there, they're, uh, they're tough to combat. And I think the way to do it is just treat it as one big, enormous organized crime case. And we did this very successfully in the 70s and 80s and took out the top three echelons of organized crime just by assembling scraps and bits of information from all over. And I successfully used uh, a hotline uh, to take out narcotics rings in Boston. So you get the world's biggest hotline whistleblower line. Right. You hire a thousand new FBI agents. You then transfer a thousand seasoned FBI agents with experience in counterterrorism to just sift the evidence that comes from all over. And that's how you get the predication for a search warrant or a wiretap that will help you make a real case. The tragedy in this case was that guy was investigated twice. And when those investigations were closed, his name was removed. That should never happen, so, not when the stakes are this high. So you were, before you were governor of Massachusetts uh, in the 1990s, you were uh, in the Justice Department. I, I was a U.S. attorney for five years, and then I was head of the criminal division of the Justice Department right. in Washington under for Reagan. two years under Reagan. So I had all this whole shooting match, terrorism, uh, so, so do CIA, you, FBI. So do you think that in terms of just domestic enforcement, do you think that the FBI needs new tools? Should there be greater you know, electronic? surveillance? Should there be greater uh, uh, on-the-ground surveillance? Mosques? There are a lot of suggestions well, need, of those Well, you need human nature. and SIGINT here, uh, the terms of the trade, but uh, I think they need resources dedicated to treating uh, ISIS and its uh, spawn in the, in the United States, particularly, as one vast, far-flung criminal conspiracy, like the five families that made up the Commission of Organized Crime in the 1980s. That's what Rudy Giuliani did. That's what I did. You, you have uh, just assembled information from all over, but you have have to have a single brain, which would be this thousand-person task force, right. sifting all that evidence to make sure you can put the pieces together. And that's how you would have got a guy like this. Governor, what you've laid out doesn't sound much different to me from what I've heard from a lot of Republicans, even some Democrats. So for voters who are trying to understand what your party is all about on fighting the war on terror, how does the Libertarian Party, how does the Johnson Well ticket differ from what Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama have been offering? Well, that's really a Justice Department proposal, not a Libertarian proposal. It's based on my experience under President Reagan in the Justice Department. And we did uh, have a lot of long, uh, long running grand jury investigations making big cases. That's that's how we took out the organized crime people. We took out the, the Asian triads, the Japanese Yakuza, the, the uh, Jamaican posses, the gun smuggling. Uh, you had a task force dedicated to Enron because those financial crimes were so complicated. They needed to have a dedicated set of personnel. And that's really what I'm talking about here, a, a flying task force uh, by analogy to the Enron and the organized crime strike forces of the 1980s. Governor, since 9-11, has the federal government passed any laws that have encroached on individual liberties that you object to? Uh, I think uh, there were a couple things in the Patriot Act that, uh, that some changes were, were made there. I mean, uh, the, the fact is... What specific uh, provisions? Uh, I think there were uh, a dozen or more in, in the rewrite back in 2005. Uh, and, and the principle is just you don't want the government compiling dossiers on people with no predication just because they want to have information, like going to the librarian and saying, who's taking out books on World War II? That's no good. But if you have two instances of a guy saying, you know, I know terrorists, I know people, I, I, I want to kill people, that's a totally different thing. That's what we call predication, and that enables you to, to keep stitching that evidence together. Let me ask you about the two uh, signature proposals of the, of the major party candidates. Can, can, candidates. Um, Let's we'll start with Donald Trump. His signature proposal is a ban, temporary ban on Muslims entering the United States, and now he's widened that uh, to say we should have a ban on all 
uh, uh, Muslim immigrants coming from uh, countries that have any kind of known proven terrorist ties. How do you feel about, yeah, about I mean, that it's, proposal? It's totally unworkable, totally unrealistic. Uh, Mr. Trump is not betraying a deep knowledge of international affairs. You can't exclude people based on their religion, as I think Speaker Ryan or somebody pointed out. Uh, today, it's, it would inflame the situation, would make it worse. You probably have a worse lone wolf copycat ratio than uh, than without that. So I think that's a very poor idea. Okay, um, Secretary Clinton and Barack Obama both think that the answer here is at least part of the answer here lies in uh, in, in more stringent gun safety measures, in particular, possibly banning the the sale of uh, assault weapons, reviving the 1990s assault ban. How do you feel about the assault weapon ban? How do you feel about that? Uh, I, I'm not one that thinks the the gun commits the offense. You know, the AR-15 was a standard military rifle, standard five shot. Uh, rifle and uh, you know if you alter it which is illegal you remove the pin make it fully automatic or put in uh, a clip or a magazine of 20 or 50 shells then of course that's that's quite different but but that's that's an independent offense pulling out that clip right so neither one you're you're on then on this front you think the, the Democrats have it wrong and Republicans have it wrong basically on dealing with this problem well yeah but but I mean I think that the people in the Justice Department uh, Jim Jim Comey who's the head of the FBI was a deputy attorney general and a good one Loretta Lynch who's the attorney general uh, headed the Eastern District of New York US Attorney's Office she knows this stuff and if it's just a question of resources the stakes here are so high now the one delicacy is I think you do have to acknowledge that there is such a thing as is Islamic Jihad uh, and that's sort of the name of the game here and, and that's the case that has to be made and that's what ISIS is all about. Governor, what would you say in the realm of national security and foreign policy is Barack Obama's greatest achievement as president? I'm a bad person to ask because I actually think the Iran deal was uh, was worth the candle. Uh, ten years, uh, buying ten years of uh, uh, slow down there. That's a long time. And I do think uh, I had a few years ago lengthy conversations with former President Khatami of Iran and I became persuaded by him that the people of Iran really do want to tilt Western. My hope is that in in those 10 years they will tilt they will tilt what? Western and that would be a great blow for truth and justice. Why does that make you a bad person to ask? Because I'm the only Republican or former Republican in the United States that thinks that. <laughs> Some, somebody might think that makes you a good person. Yeah. No, I think John Maybe. Kerry deserves an enormous amount of credit for that. That was very difficult. The whole world was screaming at him. Yeah. He stuck to his guns and he got it done. All right. Uh, Governor Weld, uh, we are not done with you. <laughs> You're going to stick here for a little more uh, interrogation after the break. Don't forget, if you're watching us in Washington, D.C., you can also listen to us on the radio radio at Bloomberg 99.1 FM. We'll be right back with Governor Weld.
back with Bill Well, the 2016 Libertarian Party candidate for vice president, also the former Republican governor of Massachusetts. Uh, governor, last segment, you uh, may be a Freudian slip. You referred to yourself as a Republican, then corrected yourself. It just popped up. A lot out. of people in the, <laughs> yeah, a lot of people at the in the in the party at the convention questioned your switch from party from the Republican Party, Libertarian Party. Was that a switch you made based on your head or your gut or your heart? To explain people sort of your passion for leaving the Republican Party and becoming a Libertarian for those who suspect it was just a matter of convenience. No, it, 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 it didn't seem like a switch to me. I've always self-identified as a Libertarian. My Bible in law school was Friedrich Hayek, who's kind of the father of uh, Libertarian movement, uh, and uh, I never was comfortable with the socially conservative, movement conservative part of the Republican platform and orthodoxy on social issues, so I always had to wear that on my back, and in a way, I feel free, free at last, now that I don't have to uh, uh, support that part of a Republican Party dogma. So one area where you are libertarian, also on economic policy. I just want you to explain, a Republican president signed the Americans with Disabilities Act into law. You're a big 10th Amendment guy. Why should Washington, why should the national government tell the state of Massachusetts and private businesses there who they, how they have to spend money to configure their businesses so that people with disabilities can be customers? Yeah, I suspect that the Libertarian Party uh, platform would not uh, espouse that. that. I think that was the older Bush, and Justin Dart and others were great friends of his, so I knew it was very important to him. So I, I more than sat still for both that and uh, the Family Leave Act, which you could also say is an intrusive uh, federal step. But uh, I don't know. I, the hearts and flowers took over for me on that. Family uh, makes my heart grow, uh, go pit-a-pat. So I, I, I think those were both George H.W. Bush, and I did support both of them. So if I said you, and you were... do to this day? Yeah. Yeah, I think I do. I mean, to roll back the Americans with Disabilities Act and say we're going to take out all these ramps, that would be, uh, that'd be a bit much. So if I were to describe you um, as, a, as, as, a, as Cecile Richards on social uh, matters and Steve Forbes on economic matters, you wouldn't reject that characterization? She's Planned Parenthood? She's the head of Planned Parenthood, yeah. Yeah, no, that's right. And I was always a Jack Kemp guy, and I think Steve Forbes probably is a, a Jack Kemp guy. I was a supply sider. Uh, you know, we went and tried to, and successfully tried to get Christy Whitman elected governor in New Jersey. This was Forbes and myself and Larry Kudlow, right. believe it or not. All right, so on the social side, abortion on demand? A-OK. -okay. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Partial the, birth uh, abortion, A-OK. -okay. Well, not, not A-OK, -okay, but not sure I want the government making any of those decisions. Uh, that's what I mean. You, yeah. you, you, don't, you don't believe in legislating on that. You think there, there should be no restrictions placed on, on those kind of activities. A, a bunch of men in Washington making decisions about some woman and what some woman in Peoria is going to do about the most intimate of her decisions? No, that just doesn't start for me. Go Governor Johnson is maybe most famous, and he is about to get more famous as you guys begin campaigning. He's most famous for his positions about legalizing drugs. How far would you go in terms of legalizing drugs? Just marijuana, hard drugs, everything? Well, I, I've, uh, as a result of uh, getting together with Gary on this, uh, I, I've endorsed the uh, marijuana legalization ba uh, ballot measure in Massachusetts for right. this year. And I found that kind of a close one. When I was a prosecutor, we used to say that marijuana was a gateway drug. I don't know. I mean, I just see alcohol doing so much more damage than marijuana that I, I can see a logical argument for it. Uh, the other stuff is conjectural at this point, I but you, hope. But, but you don't want to go far, as far as a hardcore libertarian who would say, we, you know, full, full free market, we should legalize all drugs all the way up to including cocaine, heroin, um, LSD, et cetera, et cetera. Let's, let's see if, uh, you know, I, I think these are states' issues, perhaps not, not federal issues, but uh, let's see what happens with the few states that have done marijuana, and that'll be an indicator. Okay. The, the, the jury seems to be mixed on Colorado right now. Governor, on, on domestic policy, what's been President Obama's greatest achievement? I don't know. You know, I endorsed him in 2008, and I thought he had a disappointing uh, first term. Uh, I think he started to pick it up a little bit the last uh, 18 months or so. Of course, I very much agree with him on Cuba and on the uh, executive orders that he did on uh, immigration. So it's. Uh, uh, it's easy to think a president is doing a better job when he starts doing things that you very much uh, agree with. So to get elected president, you and your uh, mm -hmm. running mate, uh, Governor Johnson, would have to win some big states. What are some big states you all are aiming to win? 
You know, I think at this point, uh, we just want to have the contrast made between us and the two major parties. You know, we don't agree with either major party. We are uh, socially uh, compassionate, inclusive. Uh, we are fiscally conservative. We were rated the two most fiscally conservative governors in the United States in the early mid-90s. So we really, uh, you know, cut the budget. We know how to do that. Uh, we think that uh, the Democrats, uh, to judge by the primary this year, uh, would probably raise taxes and spend a lot, a lot of money, and we think that hollows out the economy beyond a certain point. Governor, is a, a wider audience gets to know you than back when you were governor of Massachusetts, although you've been a player on the national stage. Tell people about your family. Well, I have uh, I've been married twice. I have five kids with my first wife, Susan Roosevelt, and uh, three stepchildren with my uh, second wife, Leslie Marshall. Susan was the great-granddaughter of Teddy Roosevelt, so I grew up in a Teddy Roosevelt uh, household. And uh, my second wife is a, a writer, and so I'm really the father of eight, and uh, it keeps you young. <laughs> that's, an impressive, uh, that's an impressive achievement on its, on its own. Um, I want to ask you about, about economics, just because, um, I mean, you talked about uh, being, you and uh, Governor Johnson being conservative on economics. Uh, you want to not spend a lot of government money. You don't want a lot of tax either. So when you look at Hillary Clinton's uh, platform and what she advocates, you look at uh, Donald Trump's. Um, which of those, uh, you, which of those concerns you more? I mean, there are a lot of Republicans who find Trump's uh, economics as problematic as the Democratic I, I, platform. I don't have a sense of the spending levels in Mr. Trump's proposals. I think they're just all over the place, and they have, uh, let me put it charitably, evolved as the campaign season has gone on. Uh, I think, and I thought when Steve Forbes ran for president, I got into the flat tax pretty deeply, and I think you could run a generous federal government uh, relatively uh, on a 19 percent flat tax and if you really wanted to cinch your belt you could run it on a 17 percent flat tax and of course both those figures are way below what we've got now gary johnson is more attracted to the idea of a consumption tax which to me i mean we'll we'll talk it right. through to me that seems a little regressive but but big tax reform yes one of the places where uh, hillary clinton and donald trump are kind of in agreement now is they are both are have become there neither one of them is exactly a full throat the free trader at this point um well, that's you, awful that, <laughs> that's awful how do you feel about uh, how do you feel about that about that issue no i think it's uh, inexcusable that they uh, they don't support the trans pacific partnership again i'm with the administration here yeah. Uh, and I'm certain about that. And, uh, you know, since the time of uh, Reagan and Clinton and NAFTA, I can remember being in the Bill Clinton White House with Newt Gingrich and myself and Bill Clinton counting votes with two days to go on the North American Free Trade Agreement. I think it's doubtful that uh, Mrs. Clinton would sign either the North American Free Trade Agreement or the Welfare Reform Act of 19... Uh, uh, 96 if it came to her desk now that's the one that put in the work requirement for welfare and uh, you know I thought Clinton did a good job moving to the center let me ask you one Bill last Clinton. question one last question real quick uh, what was your most what's the accomplishment as governor of Massachusetts that you're proudest of well we put in the work requirement for welfare and the welfare rolls uh, expense dropped about 75 percent the next year to me that indicated that that was a good idea. The other one was uh, we put in standards uh, for high stakes testing in fourth, eighth, and, and tenth grade. And ever since then, Massachusetts uh, in public schools, ever since then, Massachusetts has ranked number one in both reading and mathematics. That's obviously good for children. I also don't think I've ever seen a governor more energetically preside over St. Patrick's Day than you. So that's uh, well, that, that went with the territory. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> governor Well, thanks for coming on. We'll see you out in the hustings, thanks, as they uh, thanks, say. Mark. We appreciate it. And we're going to be right back with a little bit more from our new Bloomberg Politics National Poll right after this.
We're back with a little bit more from our brand new Bloomberg Politics National Poll. It's the first major telephone survey done of the nation since the Orlando shooting. There have been a lot of policy ideas and political insinuations flying around since that attack. So we thought we'd test out a couple of them. One thing we asked likely voters was whether, like some Republicans have been arguing, law enforcement agencies should increase surveillance of Muslim communities in America, even if it conflicts with civil liberties. The voters we talked to didn't like that idea very much. Only 27 percent said they agree with that proposal of increased surveillance. 69 percent said they disagree. So, John, it's rare that Americans side with civil liberties, unfortunately. Right. This is obviously good news for the Clinton campaign politically yeah. and surprising to me that it's so high, particularly in the wake of what happened over the weekend. Yeah, I'm surprised. And who knows, Mark, you know, we, we as we've said a couple times now, just to reemphasize, we have one night in the field uh, post Orlando where we got these questions in. So um, it, it may be that over the coming days that these numbers change uh, on a national basis as the horror of Orlando sinks in deeper. But I agree with you. It is surprising that the numbers are that uh, are that wide, especially when you think about you know, other questions that we asked in this poll that were much closer, the, as we discussed earlier uh, with Ann Selzer, you know, the split on the assault weapons, uh, the assault weapons ban is basically 50-50 down the middle of the country. Yet this, uh, this proposal here, uh, floated by Donald Trump, among other Republicans, very unpopular. And as you say, will uh, we'll give Hillary Clinton a lot of confidence in making some of the arguments she's making if she sees that number. Um, another thing that we asked voters to weigh in on uh, was something that some Republicans, uh, some Republicans have also been insinuating, um, including Donald Trump, most forcefully, that President Obama hasn't taken forceful action to stop domestic terrorism because he sort of sides with Muslims. 31% uh, of likely voters said they agree with that statement. 61%. Again, big number. 61% say they disagree. So again, Mark, big uh, well, one of these areas where uh, we're, we're less polarized than maybe we would have thought, and where Donald Trump, some of Donald Trump's, the thrust of Donald Trump's campaign is maybe finding less purchase than one would have assumed if one looked at how those things fare during the Republican nomination fight. Well, in the broadest strokes, obviously, most of that support, President, uh, uh, for Donald Trump's position is coming from Republicans. Given the gap, it means he's not getting much, if any, Democratic support and lots of independents siding against Donald Trump on that. And that is uh, going to be interesting to see. Uh, Donald Trump uh, has been under a lot of pressure from Democrats and, and uh, the press and some Republicans to start moderating some of his positions on issues of controversy to try to focus more on the economy, to try to focus more on the President Obama's record on foreign policy rather than emphasizing these issues related to national security, civil liberties, immigration, uh, Muslim Americans. So this is going to create uh, for a lot of Republicans a concern that Donald Trump continues to emphasize from their point of view the wrong things in this race. Well, yet, and yet interesting and sort of confusing the fact that given the, the fact that there was these, these, that these were the opinions of a lot of Americans on some of Trump's uh, proposals, we still have in the poll showing that 40 by a margin of 45 to 41, uh, Trump is seen by voters as being the uh, better handle, able to handle this kind of a crisis if he were uh, commander in chief a year from now. So, you know, there's, there's, he still has a, he still has some cards to play in this area. Yeah, I mean, of all the numbers in our poll, that may be the one that he, he will find most heartening. Right. They're, they're basically tied. Yep. But the reality is that Secretary Clinton would, would like to be ahead on that number. She'd like to think that Americans see her uh, experience better equipping her from that. And again, Trump's small lead there, close to within the margin of error, within the margin of error, shows you that strength is still his biggest calling card, uh, at least when it comes to national security. Okay, we're, we're going to have more from our national poll, including President Obama's favorable rating, on our website. You can look at it right now, BloombergPolitics.com. More data, John McCormick's great write-up of the poll, and we'll be right back.